Chapter 3, Romans 2, 14 to 15. Let me quote the verses. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. I wish to deal with two main views of the passage. First things first, however. What is the context? As always, this is vital. The context always holds the key to the interpretation. The passage opens, verse 12, with four, linking it with what has gone before, arguing from what has gone before. As I explained in the previous chapter, Paul is here showing the impartiality of God's judgment of all sinners, whether Jew or Gentile. There is no partiality with God. Romans 2.11 Judgment is the context. And the context is judgment. Paul is not trying to praise Gentiles in Romans 2.14-15. In fact, he's not speaking to Gentiles at all. Rather, he is reminding Jews that God is fair in his judgment. In particular, he says, although the Jews have received the law, given to them by God, and the Gentiles have not, the truth is some Gentiles, though without the law, live to a standard which puts the Jews, who have the law, to shame. And God notes the fact. Jews might think they get special treatment because they receive the law. But they're mistaken. God looks at the life, the actions, the works of a man, not his advantages. God looks at what a man does with his opportunities and advantages. He doesn't accept the man just because he gave him those opportunities and advantages. Romans 2 teaches it plainly. As for the Jews bragging about the law, the boot is on the other foot. More light brings more responsibility. This is the context. Now for Romans 2, 14 to 15. The word law appears several times in the two verses. With the exception of the clause, are a law to themselves, the law in question is the law of Moses. And when Paul spoke of Gentiles who do not have the law, he did not mean that some Gentiles have the law and others do not. The comma is very important. Gentiles, Gentiles as Gentiles, Gentiles as a whole do not have the law. Although there is no article before Gentiles, it's Gentiles, not the Gentiles, it makes no difference. As I pointed out in the first chapter, the frequent lack of the definite article before law only serves to strengthen the notion of the law. The Gentiles or Gentiles, it's all the same. Gentiles do not have the law. This is part and parcel of being a Gentile. As I showed in the previous chapter, the law was given to the Jews and not to the Gentiles. In Romans 2, 14 to 15, Paul takes this point for granted and builds on it. Contrasting Jew and Gentile, verses 9 to 10, the apostle speaks on the one hand of those who have sinned without law, as Gentiles, and on the other of those who sinned in the law, that's Jews. That's verse 12. Only the Jews were given the revelation of God's knowledge and truth in the law. Romans 2.20 The Gentiles were not. They were in darkness. Romans 2.19 They did not have the law. So far, so good. The Gentiles do not have the law. We have seen this much before. But even so, Reformed writers, as I've explained, do not always accept this obvious point so clearly revealed in Scripture. They often claim that the Ten Commandments were given to all men and that they were written on the hearts of the pagans, 
Romans 2, 14 to 15 says nothing of the sort, quite the reverse. It expressly says that Gentiles did not have the law. If this fact is ignored or explained away, Paul's point is lost. What about the punctuation of Romans 2, 14 to 15? This, as I've noted, has to be supplied. No manuscript gives us the definitive punctuation. This is simply a fact. Whatever version we use, the translators have supplied the punctuation. Now then, should the second comma come just after by nature or just before? In other words, there are two possibilities. One, when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do the things in the law. Two, when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law. Which is it? The overwhelming majority of scholars and translators opt for the second. The placing of the comma is no quibble. If the comma is placed as in the first possibility, by nature qualifies the having of the law. Gentiles do not have the law, and it's by nature that they do not have it. If the comma is placed as in the second possibility, by nature qualifies the doing of the law. Gentiles don't have the law, but some of them, by nature, do the things in the law. Let me take the first. That is, by nature qualifies the fact that the Gentiles do not have the law. Is this right? Was Paul saying that Gentiles do not have the law by nature? Now, the Greek word, by nature, it is true, can mean by birth, by physical origin. And such a use will be in keeping with other scriptures. Consequently, if in Romans 2, 14 to 15, the comma comes after by nature, the passage reads, when Gentiles who do not have the law by reason of birth do the things in the law. As I say, this makes excellent sense. But it may not be the right position for the comma. The alternative and the most common version, which puts the comma before by nature, simply says that Gentiles don't have the law, whether by reason of birth or otherwise is not specified. To sum up thus far, Jews had the law, Gentiles did not. But whether or not this is by reason of birth depends on the comma coming before or after by nature. Whichever it is, it makes no difference to the overall argument concerning the possession of the law. Gentiles don't have the law. Whether or not they don't have it by nature does not alter the fact that they don't have it in the first place. But this, of course, leads to a second point, one with far-reaching consequences. Granted that Gentiles do not have the law, when it says they do the things in the law, how do they do these things? Do they do them by nature? Or what? Once again, it depends on the comma. There are two main possibilities. One, if the comma comes after by nature, in what I will call the minority version, Romans 2, 14 to 15 reads, When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. This means, some say, 
that even though Gentiles by virtue of birth do not have the law, in some cases they keep it. And although it's not specified here, since no sinner can keep the law by his own power, this must mean they keep the law by grace. In other words, the verses are speaking about Gentiles who are in the new covenant. That is, they are Gentile believers. Two, if the comma comes before by nature, in what I will call the majority version, Romans 2, 14 to 15 reads, When Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. According to the majority version, this means that even though Gentiles do not have the law, by nature, some of them have a measure of the law, the work of the law, written on their hearts, and this, coupled with an active conscience, enables them to live out to a certain degree the things the law demands, the things in the law, even though they do not have the law as such. That is to say, all Gentiles, even though they don't have the law, have a rudimentary knowledge of it written in their hearts, and some of them live up fairly well to the light they have. These are the two possibilities I wish to consider. I will give my reasons for rejecting the first and accepting the second, the majority view. In short, Romans 2, 14 to 15 is speaking of unbelieving Gentiles who do not have the law, whereas the Jews do, yet in some cases Gentiles more nearly keep the law than do the Jews. But let me consider the two possibilities before I show why I plump for the second. Possibility 1. The minority view. Does Romans 2, 14-15 teach that some Gentiles are believers and therefore keep the law by the provisions of the new covenant? As I said, if the comma comes after by nature, as in the minority version, Romans 2, 14-15 states that even though Gentiles by reason of birth don't have the law, some of them keep it. Although it's not specified here, these Gentiles keep the law because they are in the new covenant. In other words, they are Gentile believers who keep the law by grace, with an implied contrast, perhaps, with by nature. In short, although Paul doesn't say so, the passage refers to believing Gentiles in the new covenant. But this claim simply does not fit the overall context of Romans 1, 18 to 3.20, namely man's sin and the consequent wrath of God on all mankind. The context is king, remember. As we've seen, judgment is the context. Above all, Paul is here considering God's justice, his judgment, his fairness in executing wrath on all the human race, both Jew and Gentile. Consequently, to introduce at Romans 2, 14 to 15, the thought that some Gentiles are converted and possess the blessings of the new covenant, the law written on the heart without so much as a whisper of an explanation, seems forced. Very much so. Something jars. By this stage in the letter, Paul has not sufficiently set out the gospel to be able to introduce the concept of the new covenant and its provisions. Yet, we are asked to believe Paul did it, and did it without any reference to Jeremiah or Ezekiel or any other prophet, and with no comparison to the old covenant. He did it, apparently, as an aside. Contrast the way the writer to the Hebrews brought in the new covenant, in chapters 8 and 10. Having built his case solidly over several chapters, and the way Paul himself spoke of it in 2 Corinthians 3. Are we to think Paul could mention such a momentous matter in passing in Romans 2? Short enough, Paul wasn't speaking of the new covenant in Romans 2.15. The context is judgment. <laughs>
But what of Romans 2, 7 and 10? Here Paul does speak of believers who by their attitude and works show their inward experience of grace. At least, this is how I understand the verses. If this is so, does Romans 2, verses 7 and 10 not support the view that Romans 2, 14 to 15 speaks of Gentiles in the New Covenant? I think not. The two passages, Romans 2, 4 to 11, and 2, 12 to 24, deal with different things. Up to the end of Romans 2, 3, Paul has been setting out a massive indictment of the human race, and God's impartial judgment of sinners on the basis of their works. And he has yet more to say about it. But he does not develop his argument in the verses which immediately follow. It is in Romans 2, 12 to 24 where he does that. What is his argument? Just this. God's impartial judgment of sinners is according to their works. Having the law of Moses makes no difference. Jew or Gentile, for that matter, may condemn others. But do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Romans 2, 3. The fact is, there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Romans 2, 11 to 12. As far as Paul's argument goes, it is verses 11 to 12, not 4 to 11, which follow on from Romans 2, 3. Do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things, and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. What I'm saying is, Romans 2, 4 to 11 is not a development of Paul's main argument. Rather, it is an aside a passionate aside at that. As I read it, Paul the preacher can't help himself, overwhelmed by what he has just written about the wrath of God. In the verses leading up to Romans 2-3, he is moved with compassion for sinners, and he shows it. The harrowing thought of the terrible consequences of God's wrath in the judgment and condemnation of hardened and impenitent sinners, which the Apostle has just set out in Romans 1, 18 to 2, 3, moves him, compels him to interrupt his argument for a moment. He must get his passionate thoughts down on paper. Running ahead of himself, almost breaking out into the positive aspect of the gospel, his feelings compel him to address ignorant sinners, those who despise the riches of God's goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads them to repentance, and who in consequence are treasuring up wrath for themselves, Romans 2, 4-5. He has to let his main argument go by the board for a moment, he must inject a note of hope into the thunderous cataract of warning and doom. This is why he declaims on the two sorts of men, the godly and the ungodly, the two classes being shown for what they are by their works, wanting no sinner, Jew or Gentile, to come to indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, Romans 2, 8-9. Paul, by means of a searching question, Romans 2, 4, tries to bring sinners to repentance. But this white-hot discussion is a digression from his main theme, which he left at the end of Romans 2, 3, namely, God's impartial judgment based on works. It is, as I say, as he moves from Romans 2, 10 to 2, 11, and especially as he opens verse 12, that Paul lets go of his impassioned plea to sinners and gets back on course, God's impartial judgment. But now he develops his case 
by introducing the notion of law. I stress this. Paul has not mentioned law up to this point. This is why I say Romans 2, verses 7 and 10, and Romans 2, 14 and 15, are not dealing with the same issues. Whereas there is no mention of law in Romans 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 11. Law is the dominant note of Romans 2, 12 to 24. Romans 2, 4 to 11, and 2, 12 to 16, therefore, deal with different things. Consequently, Romans 2, verses 7 and 10, and 2, 14 to 15, do not describe the same people or speak about the same issues. Nor do I think Paul's later statement in Romans 2, 28 to 29 militates against what I'm saying. In Romans 2, 25 to 29, Paul is moving on to yet another aspect of God's impartial judgment based on works. Namely, it doesn't matter if a man is circumcised in the flesh or not. What matters is his heart and the consequent effect on his life. Once again, this is not the issue in Romans 2, 14 to 15. And what about the verses themselves, Romans 2, 14 to 15? They cannot be speaking of the fulfillment of the promise of the new covenant. Romans 2, 14 to 15 doesn't say that Gentiles have the law written on their hearts. Rather, they have the work of the law written on their hearts. Nor does Romans 2, 14 to 15 say that Gentiles keep the law. It says when they do the things in the law. What is more, the words in Romans 2, 14 to 15, who do not have the law, cannot apply to the regenerate, since, according to God's promise, in Jeremiah 31, verse 33, the regenerate do have the law written on their hearts. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. In addition, those spoken of in Romans 2, 14, have only a knowledge of the law, whereas those in the new covenant delight in it. What is more, how can the regenerate be said to be a law to themselves? They're under the law to Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 6. Finally, it is significant that there is no mention whatsoever of the Holy Spirit in Romans 2, 14 to 15, or its context. For all these reasons, Romans 2, 14 to 15 cannot be referring to regenerate Gentiles in the New Covenant. None of this is quibbling. The work of the law is equivalent to a life which in some measure corresponds to the law, a long way short of saying that Romans 2.14-15 to 15 is concerned with Gentiles in the New Covenant. So much for the minority view of the passage. I don't think it holds up. If, however, the minority version is right, and the passage does refer to the New Covenant, then it could be properly quoted as a verification of what I will have to say on that subject throughout my book, but it doesn't ring true, at least for me. As a result, I'm left with the second possibility. Possibility 2. The majority view. Does Romans 2, 14-15 teach that some unbelieving Gentiles live a life which shows a rudimentary knowledge of the law? If the comma comes before by nature, Romans 2, 14 to 15 states that even though Gentiles do not have the law, some of them, by the light of nature, coupled with an active conscience, live out to a certain degree the things the law demands, the things in the law, thus showing some measure of the law, the work of the law, written in their hearts. In other words, Gentiles, even though they do not have the law, have a law. A vague, rudimentary knowledge of law written in their hearts. They have a, a conscience, some sense of right and wrong, and some of them instinctively live up fairly well to the light they have. In addition, Romans 1, 19-20 and verse 32 speaks of precisely the same thing as Romans 2, 14-15. 
Compare Gentiles show the work of the law written in their hearts, Romans 2, 14 to 15, with the reference to all men in Romans 1, 19 to 20. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. What may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. And according to Romans one thirty two, all men know the righteous judgment of God, the ordinance of God, God's righteous decree. Surely this lies behind Peter's words in Acts 10, verse 35. In every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness does what is right. While Cornelius was not a converted man at the time, he had a measure of light and he lived up to it. All this comes under Genesis 1, verses 26 to 27. God created man in his own image. God created a man, a moral creature, a rational creature. Man was given a conscience. He could weigh his actions and thoughts. He'd been given a sense of right and wrong after sin entered the world. And God has put eternity in their hearts, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. This marks man out from the animal. And this is the meaning of Romans 2, 14 to 15. To sum up, the comma should come as in all the leading English versions. That is, when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things of the law. In other words, Romans 2, 14 to 15 speaks of unbelieving Gentiles who, though they don't have the law, show by their lives that they have a rudimentary knowledge of right and wrong, and by an active conscience they live up to that standard according to the light they have. The NIV footnote of John 1 verse 9 is relevant. Christ gives light to every man who comes into the world, or enlightens every man coming into the world. The New American Standard Bible in the margin. Every man as a conscience, enlightened by a rudimentary knowledge of right and wrong. We have a test bed to hand. The law was given through Moses, John 1.17, yes. But the people who lived before Moses were judged for their wickedness. Why? Because all are sinners, Romans 3, 9 and 23. Whether before or after Moses, whether under the law or not, and because the sinners in question knew they were doing wrong. How did they know that? God explains. He does not judge sinners for breaking a law they were never under, but for suppressing the truth that is in them. Romans 1, 18-19. Let me explore this a little. God gave his law to Israel on Mount Sinai through Moses. Also, by the law is a knowledge of sin. Sin is lawlessness. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. And sin is not imputed when there is no law. Yet even before Sinai, death spread to all men because all sin. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. This was because through Adam... Sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5, 12-14. They sinned in Adam, and they sinned in their own right. They had no excuse. By creation they had known the truth. But as a consequence of the fall, they had stifled this knowledge and given God up. Therefore God gave them up to a life of sin and misery, including sexual perversion, envy, murder, the breakdown of family life, and the glorying in wickedness. Romans 1, 18-32. All this dates from Adam's fall, is with us yet, and will be with us until Christ shall come again. 
not that things are as bad as they might be. This is earth, after all, and not hell. There is still a rudimentary knowledge of right and wrong in men. Conscience hasn't been entirely seared, let alone obliterated. This is the point of Romans two twelve to 14 Nevertheless, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. 1 John 5, verse 19. What evidence is there for it? Evidence in abundance. For the present day, the calling of witnesses would be superfluous. Virtually every news bulletin and newspaper is full of violence and wretchedness. As for the start of the misery and its development among men, the Bible tells us plainly about that. Even though the law had not been given, the variety of sins men committed, as recorded in the book of Genesis and the early chapters of Exodus, is legion. Murder, anger, hatred, war, plunder, idolatry, ill-treatment, slavery, adultery, drunkenness, lying, sexual abuse and depravity of almost every hue, including homosexuality, prostitution and rape, polygamy and incest, jealousy and envy, deceit, cheating, blasphemy, hypocrisy, and so on, all defiled humanity. And yet the law had not been given. After God's covenant with Noah, Genesis 9, men knew by direct revelation that murder was wrong. But of course, they had instinctively known that long before Noah's time. I've already referred to, does not nature teach you? In short, with the exception of the Sabbath, all the other commands of the Ten were broken before the Ten Commandments had been given. But, and of far greater significance, notice that whatever sin was committed as recorded in the book of Genesis, God never once referred to any of the Ten Commandments. Of course not. They were not yet given to Israel. Israel as a nation did not yet exist. Yet the concept of wickedness and sin on the one hand and righteousness on the other is written plainly in the book. As is the concept of obedience to commands. On occasion, God gave men direct revelation concerning sin, but generally not. Though there was some sense of God, some fear of God in the human race, Yet in this regard, Jacob and his family stood out from pagans. Furthermore, changes in morality occurred as time passed. In truth, some things which had been commanded by God and practiced by men before Sinai were regarded as sins after Sinai. Altar building, for instance. The theme continues when we come to the early chapters of Exodus. God commands or instructs men. His ordinances are set up, and men go on sinning, disobeying. Yet the first appearances in the Bible of the word law, apart from in-laws, comes at Genesis 26, verse 5, 47, verse 26, and so on. And how rare they are at that stage. What's the explanation of all this? As I've said, Reformed teachers nearly always claim it was because the law of Sinai had been given to all men in Adam. There is no biblical warrant for it. In fact, it flies in the face of Scripture. The only explanation lies in Romans 2, 14-15. A rudimentary knowledge of the work of the law is inscribed on all men's hearts since Adam's fall. This is what Romans 2, 14-15 teaches. This is what the record of the days before Sinai declares. Men sinned in those days. Some had some commands from God, which some obeyed, and others did not. But the sense of right and wrong, even though somewhat hazy, existed in men and did so before the Jews received a written law from God. Indeed, even before the giving of the law to Israel, some pagans had a more finely tuned sense of right and wrong than some of the godly. 
Take the episode of Abraham and Sarah lying to Abimelech, king of Gerah, the latter's reaction, and his reproof of the father of the faithful. Abimelech certainly showed a greater sense of morality than Abraham. The same can be said for Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis 26. Hamor the Hivite, though he certainly had his faults, showed more integrity than Jacob's son in Genesis 34. Where did pagans get their sense of right and wrong, their sense of injustice? Romans 2, 14-15 is the clear biblical explanation. A notorious child murderer is given what most people consider to be a lenient sentence. And there's a public outcry. It's not right. It's not fair. It's unjust. Something ought to be done about it. I agree. But where did it come from? This sense of rightness and wrongness, fairness and unfairness. Two men are overheard having a quarrel. I helped you when you were in trouble. And now you won't do the same for me. It's not fair. You won't catch me twice. Again I ask, where does this talk of right and wrong, fair and unfair come from? Why do we speak to ourselves? Sometimes to rebuke ourselves for an action or a word. But more often than not, to excuse ourselves. Two children are playing on the mat. No, you went first last time. It's my turn now. How do children know instinctively, whether or not the parents have taught them, that they should take turns? If there's a God, why does he allow war or famine or pestilence or earthquakes or whatever? Why do the innocent have to suffer as well as the guilty? If he's God, can't he stop it? Where does this sense of good and bad Innocence and guilt come from. How do we know that pain, misery and death are bad? Where does kindness come from? How do we know that kindness is good and cruelty bad? I ask again, where does all this morality come from? Why is it universal in the human race? The explanation is Romans 2, 14-15. This is a point of far greater significance than at first appears, as I will now explain. What bearing does this have on the rest of my book? Just this. As I explained at the close of the previous chapter, since the Gentiles don't have the law of Moses, care must be taken in the exegesis of those New Testament passages which speak of sinners who were once under the law, but have by Christ been delivered from it. Those passages which were written to converted Jews or proselytes present no problem. But what are those passages which were written to converted Gentiles? One explanation is that those believing Gentiles needed to be taught the Old Testament background to their faith, especially with regard to the law. Why? Because often they were being attacked by Judaizers who wanted them to submit to the law. Paul wrote to teach believers some basic facts about the law in order to highlight the stupidity, the wrongness of converted Gentiles going under the old, fulfilled and abolished Jewish system. And since they, as Gentiles before conversion, were never under the law, why on earth would they think to put themselves under the very law from which Christ, by his death, released believing Jews? Paul would have none of it. Having said that, there are a few remaining passages where it does appear that believing Gentiles had also, in some sense, been under the law in their unregenerate days and were now delivered from it in Christ. I will bring such to your attention as we go on. The question is, how can these passages be explained? How were these Gentiles under the law before conversion? The answer is Romans 2, 14 to 15. Let me give but one illustration. Take Romans 7, 4. Assuming that the recipients of the letter were not converted Jews or proselytes, 
and is that certain, then we have to face the fact that Paul told rank Gentile believers that they had become dead to the law. They had died to the law. How can this be, since they were never under the law? I make the following suggestion. Israel, having the law from Sinai, served as a model, a paradigm, to show how God deals with people under law. The Gentiles, while not under the law of Moses, are nevertheless under some sort of law, Romans 2, 14 to 15. While Romans 7, 4 then is strictly applicable only to Jewish believers, the principle applies equally to Gentile converts and their law. This has large consequences. Anticipating further developments, as we shall see, the history of the Jews shows the utter uselessness of sinners attempting justification by works. Since the Jews couldn't find salvation through the law, even the law given them by God, then no system of works will enable sinners to earn salvation. This leaves the human race in total, helpless bondage, a bondage from which only Christ can deliver. This very important corollary comes directly from this look at Romans 2:14 to 15. Paul's teaching here is of far greater significance than it seems at first glance. From time to time, therefore, I shall refer back to this passage and the explanation of it which I have put forward in this chapter. <laughs> 